And now let's come back here home with uh, Ocean uh, Saritas that everybody knows here. And uh, also one thing that I admire is that he has been the editor in chief of the Foresight magazine for a decade. That's quite a fantastic job. So congratulations on that. And now let's uh, hear about um, your uh, idea about digitalization of Foresight, please. Jose, thank you very much for the um, introduction. Um, I'm actually amazed that you precisely know that this is my 10th year as an editor of the Foresight Journal. So it's a correct information. I'm impressed. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, we are all uh, um, talking about digitalization and new technologies, emerging technologies, and how they are going to actually change our lives. So I will. Um, look at the topic um, from a foresight perspective, mainly, and uh, try to uh, discuss very briefly how foresight is digitalizing in this uh, area, and what are the tasks for uh, foresight, again, because we need to actually start thinking about foresight in a different ways, too. So um, some of you may have seen this uh, picture already. I just wanted to put it again, because uh, we see that foresight is actually an evolutionary process. So foresight is uh, changing. The way we do foresight is changing as the world changes. And also world is changing as we have new ways of doing foresight. So our foresight also shapes the world at the same time. And this evolutionary process is ongoing for a long time. This picture is just uh, presenting this process decade by decade particularly starting from the 1950s when we started talking about in institutional foresight. We moved from individual foresight to institutional foresight. So um, in the foresight literature, you may find many uh, different ways of um, uh, classifying foresight uh, and then uh, showing actually how foresight is um, evolving in time. So from the... Um, uh, technology point of view, we can uh, come up with a different uh, classification of different eras in foresight, in the evolution of foresight. This could be called like intuitive futures. So this was the early foresight. Mainly, we can also call this like handmade foresight, where people were actually discussing things and then uh, sharing with each other their ideas, and mainly by talking to each other. Then uh, we started talking about mechanical futures, where we started seeing the use of some primitive technologies to help with the uh, decision making. So some simple calculations, maybe some sort of trend analysis. So some of the modeling approaches were computerized already from the 60s, 70s. And later, um, it, from the beginning of the 90s, we started seeing computer-aided futures. So we started actually using more computers more efficiently. The technologies have evolved. We got a larger processing power. And then we started using computers more for the purpose of our foresight activities. What is next is actually digital futures. So where computers will be moving from being, at being tools we use they are going to be actually as stakeholders with us around the table. So they will be also represented actually within this system. And this represents a fundamentally different uh, era than the previous one. So we can see the emergence of machines and how they are entering into our lives with this picture. So um, if you look at the uh, trends of uh, digitalization, we see that actually this is pretty much supported. So what is happening in the, uh, this is an analysis by i 4 system, our famous system, and uh, which can process a number of millions of uh, data. It is going to reach to billion, actually, very soon. Mm -hmm. So just over uh, 350 million documents in the database. So all this data actually suggests that we are moving into digital world. And this digital world is shaped by technological advancements. We see an emergence of digital economy, establishment of new value chains, and all these are pushing us for digital transformation, digital innovation, and changing the way we do our businesses, we deliver our services, and etc. 
what we see is a greater role for artificial intelligence within this process. When we look at the artificial intelligence, the trends we see that actually they are going really high and up. In the 1980s, we saw like there were about 700 papers, uh, publications on this topic, and today we see that we are almost approaching to 90,000 per year, and this number is likely to increase. So uh, what is coming uh, within those papers is a discussion about artificial intelligence itself. We are talking about robotics, learning systems, and data mining, for example, machine learning, decision making, forecasting, and decision support systems, simulation systems, social networking, human computer interaction. So these are all actually elements of foresight as we uh, speak today. So we can see that machines are already playing some roles of learning, predicting, decision making, interacting, networking, and so on. So there are many functions actually being fulfilled by machines, or there are discussions, or there is research going on on this topic. And we see that uh, if you look at the um, countries, for example, doing uh, research on this topic, China is the leading, followed by United States, India, United Kingdom, among the others. So we see that actually uh, there are several institutions probably to watch closely, so we can probably look at what is going on within those places and what areas are emerging, because research is the beginning of most of the things. So what is in today's research agenda will be on our uh, personal life agenda in the near future. So it's always a good idea to look at. It is always also a good idea to see actually how ready uh, we are for this. So we see that some of the countries which are doing heavy research on this topic are not quite ready yet. Um, among the countries which are ready, we see Singapore, United Kingdom, Germany, uh, USA, Finland, Sweden, and etc. So it is also important to see actually how prepared we are for what is likely to emerge in the near future. Again, if you look at the implications for um, artificial, of our artificial intelligence on foresight, we can see that they are actually addressing some basic features of foresight, like human interaction. So networking, inclusivity, participation are important aspects of foresight. And we see that actually artificial intelligence is beginning to play a role in human-machine collaboration. Um, we can see that we are talking about virtual intelligence. We have been talking about collective intelligence. Joe mentioned collective intelligence of humans. And now we are talking about virtual intelligence of machines. And we have actually learning machines. So this is uh, enabling us to uh, collect information and almost like knowing about everything and anything at any time. So there are actually greater possibilities for knowing. And, uh, and we can see that now it is possible actually for machines to do this in an unsupervised way. So machines may learn themselves. And automated writing, and uh, uh, probably as researchers, uh, academics, we will be unemployed very soon. <laughs> or writing papers will not be counted as performance indicators, so, um, because machines can already do that. So we should also be searching for some new roles for ourselves. How to position ourselves in this changing world is a big question. So have a rest. <laughs> And universal basic income is paid in our pocket, so it's going to be a good life. This is a good and desirable scenario, <laughs> as Ibon uh, also mentioned, actually, it corresponds to that. Um, and at the same time, we see that there are terms like robotic policy. So we see that some uh, robotic analysts, lo robotic policy is coming on the agenda. And again, automated decision making. So some decisions will be made automatically. There are so many terms, if you dig in this figure, which can be quite inspirational. So actually, all these technologies um, will enable a number of developments in our lives. So, and I consider that it is the job of foresight practitioners and researchers 
to understand how we can inform decision making and policy making in this kind of a um, world where technologies are emerging not by one by one, but all at the same time. So we will be actually over flooded with a number of developments like information revolution. We moved from a few books to large amounts of data and only past year, for example, created 90% of the world's data. And so far we could only use 1% of it. So in one year we created 90% of the data created so far in the world. So this is a great amount of information and we could only use 1% of it so far. Interconnection, so we see that actually um, we have devices and we need energy to power those devices. They are connected, they are much more connected and data transfer is happening much more. And we are actually moving into an era of brain net. So uh, wiring brains and their competitional units together. So there are a lot of neuroscientists in the world and we have actually also our, uh, in our previous conference, we had our guests from the University of Drexel in the US. So they are looking at the brain to brain communication systems at the moment. We are living in an integrated world and there are more than 25 billion connected devices already. And we are now moving into human into, in the loop systems. So this is actually converging human and machine intelligence together. So the future is about convergence. And we are also seeing that we have greater possibilities to innovate in this world. We have greater possibilities to share, to create ideas and to share them with the others by creating some virtual reality or artificial reality images um, and figures. And infrastructure is developing. So we see that um, we have a predictive artificial intelligence, for example, for infrastructure and disaster management. And we see that there are autonomous cars in traffic. They see, we also see that there are um, smarter cities and using um, various ways of smart energy, smart transportation and smart people too. Industry is also transforming. So we see a heavy engagement of robots in the industry. And today there are 31 million robots help households across the world. And we also see that the way we communicate with each other is changing. So we are using social media and we are actually moving towards sharing economy and we are more and more using blockchain technologies. So we have heard several times about these technologies. I think it's very important to look at all of them at the same platform like this, because the future will be shaped not by one of them, but by all of them and the synergies to be created actually between them. So we need to understand the systemic uh, interactions and then how the narrative of our lives will be different from today in the next couple of decades to come. I will focus on briefly one of those technologies now, which is the uh, blockchain technology. You heard about this, and I think there's nobody who hasn't heard about this technology. So very briefly, this is a distributed ledger that contains all transactions executed in an electronic network. This technology can be described with three words. It is disintermediated, it is censorship resistant, and tamper proof, so nobody actually can go and make a mess um, in it, as far as we know. And we have seen several um, applications of that, and the most common is cryptocurrencies. But now, um, I myself, with a few colleagues, and I'm also inviting you actually to think with me, and how we can bring this blockchain technology in non-financial applications, such as in policy making, which most of us are engaged, where we need bottom-up approaches with more decentralized, distributed, transparent, and evidence-based processes. Actually, you can see how well they match the expectations of policymaking and what the blockchain offers actually match in a quite good uh, way. And among the immediate benefits are actually that we can try to uh, kind of 
open wide-ranging policy discourse, we can collect evidence and intelligence from wider population, we can explore alternative futures and set priorities in a collective way and in a more transparent way. And the results can be accessible, the, uh, the outputs can be distributed wider, and the implementation can be monitored in this way. So what if we use idea as a currency in this process? And this is where the uh, uh, idea chain actually process emerges. So from blockchain to idea chain, where we start using a unit of an idea uh, instead of a currency or idea as currency. So this would actually help us, first of all, to generate some ideas in a certain domain and then create a chain based on these ideas collect data about it, synthesize these data and ideas together, and then create a participative and transparent policy process for that. So it may work like this. An idea is created on a certain domain and described, a short idea, and then this idea is digitalized as a blog, and then the idea blog is broadcast to stakeholders and experts on the network, which are distributed. They are not necessarily sitting together in a traditional panel environment. I find it much healthier if we access people in their own context and in their own setting because they won't influence each other. So they'll be able to think at their own pace. So this idea is broadcasted to a number of people in cities, in rural areas, in industry, businesses, policymakers, and so on. And then, um, if a consensus emerges on distributed network, this idea is approved. So if actually this uh, members, stakeholders, parts, nodes of this network approves to a certain level, then the idea is approved. Then the idea is combined with other relevant ideas in a transparent record. And then the idea is transmitted to policy decision makers or potential funders for support. So what happens next? ID is funded with idea coins. All contributors of the idea are recorded on the system, who initiated, who contributed, how much, to what extent. So these are all actually recorded in a transparent way. So contributors receive proportional idea coins and esteem factors on this system. And then these idea coins can then be converted for the purchase of goods, services, and they can even be converted to miles and points for travels. And also the results generated by these ideas, by these projects, are also validated through the system following these steps at each phase of implementation. Then the idea makers receive uh, enough funding. So um, this process can be adapted for the foresight uh, stages too. Uh, if you look at the foresight stages from the initiation, initial uh, planning stage, so we can see that foresight topics can be identified in this way, and data can be collected in a similar way with more evidence-based foresight with original and verified information sources and experts. So the quality of evidence also increases because we get validation over the network and greater diversity and accuracy for scenarios, for example, using the wisdom of crowds. We can better identify priorities and future targets with a broader base of network of stakeholders who are not necessarily influenced by each other. So there will be a natural consensus emerging instead of a forced consensus. And we can also explore some alternative strategies we can monitor the results during the implementation phase. We can also, again, distribute the outputs widely and then make the whole participation process decentralized and inclusive with larger number of participants. So uh, to conclude, um, idea chain may uh, support foresight process, as I have just explained. It may also create a platform for innovation commercial commercialization because it may bring together um, innovators and investors at the same platform. 
and individual or crowdfunding mechanisms can be used for this purpose. And research funding bodies like the European Union, for example, can apply idea chain too. Uh, for example, for Horizon Europe projects. An open research zone may lead to more innovative solutions. And we can actually see that a number of researchers, research conducting bodies can self-organize as virtual teams, and then they may conduct their research. And finally, the idea chain may contribute to the true meaning of the world citizenship, where ideas can be freely shared between individuals and institutions. This may facilitate the process for ra raising awareness, eliciting ideas, generating consensus for policy actions, and for instance, in order to address global sustainability issues like sustainable development goals. So, if you are ready to work with Idea Chain, then I'm more than happy to talk to you, cooperate with you, and take next steps on the way to application. Thank you.